Well, welcome to lecture six, where we're actually going to get down to some nitty gritty and actually doing some memory training and show you the kind of techniques which enabled Dominic O'Brien to perform his quite amazing memory feats. A very interesting question was raised with me by Mr. Sawyer Khan during the break, if I may mention it. He was saying, well, you know, you're saying you're using these breathing techniques to get into a particular frame of mind. But Dominic O'Brien actually didn't seem to do anything like that. He just kind of went and did it. The point is that Dominic O'Brien has been doing this for a good many years, a, a lot of time, and he does it pretty much on a, if not a daily basis, on a many times a week basis. And his brain will automatically put itself into the right state of mind to perform simply because it's practice. When you start, you need to deliberately do it. The more you do it, the easier it will become and the more automatic it will become so that when you're confronted with a memory task, a learning task, your brain will automatically click into that mode. And a kind of a subsidiary question that is how long will this mental state, which I've said is the predominating uh, theta waves and alpha waves, this kind of sandwich of waves between beta, the high speed waves, and, and the slower speed waves, how long will it last? When you first start, you will find you are very easily distracted. You will find that a telephone rings or somebody makes a noise out in another room or a car backfires or almost anything. A fly buzzing around the window frame will be sufficient to cause you to break your concentration. As you become more practiced with it, you will find you can actually focus very much more clearly on, on what is going on and you will not be so distracted. I remember I, I was talking some years ago, because I do quite a lot of work with sports people, and I was talking to Nick Faldo. And I said to him, because on one occasion when he was playing at St Andrews Golf Course in Scotland, I think, there was a f gorse fire and the smoke actually blew, blew across the course. And I said, were you distracted by the gorse fire? And he said to me, and also, he said, what gorse fire? I didn't actually notice it, because he was so focused, his attention was... And, and the, the ability to do that is nothing kind of unique to some one person, not to another. It's simply a question of being able to practice. It's a question of being able to practice so you develop what is called flow. Now, flow is a very, very interesting mental state to be in. It's where the time actually passes so fast that you don't notice time is passing. If you've got something which really absorbs you, maybe your work, maybe a hobby, you'll find that when you get into the flow state, you look at the clock and the two hours have passed. You think, well, where, where did that go? You're completely absorbed in what you're doing. And that's a kind of flow state. is an ideal state for focusing and for concentrating. Another, just uh, something which came up in, in, in the break, was on, on selective memory and uh, what is called the, the cocktail party uh, syndrome, where you're paying attention to somebody who's talking to you at a cocktail party and you're able to exclude all the other conversations buzzing around you. But in fact, at some level, your brain is monitoring what's going on. Just as a, a mother who is asleep will have a very low threshold of, a, of awareness for a baby, her baby crying. Or if you're asleep and you smell smoke, you'll immediately wake up. So your brain is never really focusing. It, your brain is taking in stuff from outside world, however carefully you're focused. And indeed, if somebody in the room mentions your name or uses a blasphemy or uses some kind of bad word, you will hear it. And that's why, you know, you utter a curse and suddenly the room is dead silent and everybody's staring at you. It's because although they were engaged in the conversation with the other person, they're actually monitoring it. So we are much more uh, in tune with our environment th than perhaps we often believe. Now, <coughs> there was a man in the 19th century called Hermann Ebbinghaus who practiced, he studied, he made the first really scientific psychological study of memory. And what Herr Ebbinghaus did was to rent a room in Paris and he spent his entire life learning nonsense symbols, or his working life. And he then measured how long it took him to forget the nonsense syllables. Okay? So it must have been a real pain to be married to. But that's what he did. He'd go up at no, 8.30 whenever, have his petit déjeuner, and then he'd go up and he'd write out all these nonsense syllables and he'd, he'd memorise them. And he created what is called the forgetting curve. And this is um, perhaps rather depressing. It shows how quickly we forget things. So if we don't make a written note or something or haven't trained our memories in the way we're going to learn in the next uh, 40, 50 minutes or so, within an hour, you've probably forgotten round about 40% or so. Certainly by the end of the day, your memory 
will be right the way down around about 30% or something like that. Within three days, it'll be down to about 10%. Okay, so you, you tend to forget very quickly. Uh, now, another man, a man called Matthew Erdley, who is in New York, psychiatrist, psychologist rather, he showed that by rehearsing correctly the information, you can actually improve your memory. It, go, it goes right the way back to where it was uh, when, you when you're actually reading or acquiring the information. And it all depends on when you actually rehearse it. And that seems to be the actual crux of the matter. It's when you rehearse. So what he would say, suppose you go to a lecture or you go to a meeting or you go to somewhere where you're not able to take a written note and you want to remember. What you need to do is to actually remember how many topics you want to remember. It's very important to be able to tell the brain there are ten topics or something like that. So it would have been much harder for Dominic O'Brien to remember those numbers or those cards if he hadn't got a target to aim for. He knew how many cards there were in the pack. He knew how, how many numbers Daisy had written up on the board. So that's very important. So what I tend to do if I'm going to a meeting, I tend to keep some coins in, in my pocket and I will uh, extract a coin and move it to the other pocket every time there's a point I want to remember. So then at the end of the time, all I've got to do is count up the number of coins in my left pocket, uh, or indeed, <laughs> <laughs> count up the number of coins in my left pocket or on the floor, or wherever I've chosen to put them, and that will give you the So I now have got to remember there were ten things said at this lecture which I want to remember. And then uh, five minutes or so, I'll find somewhere quiet, and I'll go back, and I won't try and strain. You never want to try and strain your memory because you'll make yourself more anxious. You'll go out of this alpha theta state. So just in a relaxed way, how much can I remember? What, what comes into my mind? Okay. And just go try and remember as many of the ten topics as you can. And then an hour later, another few minutes spent just going back through the topics. Um, then uh, um, uh, I, I, this, this says one day later. Uh, just go back over it again, two days, three days. You don't, you don't want to spend a lot of time. You just want to re re refresh, that, refresh that memory. Um, for other things, you might need to, need to have a slightly uh, shorter memory period. So, so rehearsal is vital. When you rehearse, even more important. Note the number of topics. First recall after five minutes. Now, in our research, um, although Erdley's research showed that one hour and then, and then th th uh, next day, we feel one hour, yes, one hour is very important. But I would try and then do it again depending on how important it is you remember it accurately, after three hours. And then after six hours, uh, or, or just before bed, depending on, on how the time is doing out. But it's five minutes, one hour, three hours, and then the final session just before you go to bed. Just running over in a very relaxed way. What you don't want to try and do is to force your memory, because that's the, the worst possible way to use memory. Um, then if you can return to it occasionally in the days that follow, that's good as well. The essence of good memory, and this is something which came out of Dominic's presentation very clearly, is organization. If you just stuff facts in, in, into your brain, there will be no way one fact will necessarily be associated with the other facts. So this kind of linking of facts together, and particularly limping, linking images together, is, is absolutely crucial to this te technique. Now, we all of us, I'm sure, experience what is called in psychology the TOT, tip of the tongue phenomena. You're trying to remember a quotation, or a word, or a name, or a number, and interestingly, you, you know what it's not. So when something pops into your mind, you say, no, that's not it. You know it's what it's not, you just don't know what it is. And this is tip of the tongue. So when you, and, and this is very, very common if you're doing an exam, uh, because, you know, you do a lot of revision, you go into the exam room, you turn over the paper, and it's very, quite hard actually to remember who, 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 your own name. Who the hell am I? Uh, and then you look at the, you read the questions. It's a very typical thing, and we've all probably been through, well, we all will have been through it. You read the questions, and you think, right, that's it. I don't know a single answer to any of these questions. The way to do it is to try and think of any single fact which is associated with the fact you want to recover, and then just free associate around it. Just let anything drift into your mind and you'll get there. Also, very interestingly, you often, if you go to bed not knowing somebody's name or a quote, when you wake up, it'll, it'll be there. And this is because when the brain is relieved of all its duties in the waking state, it actually has more time to search for it. It will go on searching. Your brain is... I hate talking about the brain in this way, but because it's kind of, kind of Cartesian dualism that raises its ugly head. I mean, my brain is me, okay, well, but it's, it's very hard, actually very hard to talk about the brain in a sensible way. 
Your brain, well, no, it's my brain. You know what I mean? It's kind of, well, what am I talking about? Well, all I'm saying is the brain is actually very obedient. If you give it a task to do, it'll go on trying to do it. If you tell it you, you want to remember something, it'll go on trying to find it. So it, it, it's easy for you to do it at night. So if you've got something on the tip of your tongue, don't struggle to retrieve it, because the harder you struggle, the worse it's going to become. Just relax. Just free associate around it, and maybe it'll come in, and maybe it'll just pop into your head. Very often people tell me, and, and indeed in my own experience and research experience, it pops into your head at the most unexpected moment. You're doing some very routine task. You're washing the dishes, or you're walking the dog, you're having a shower or a bath, and suddenly you go, oh, there it is. And it's, it's kind of when you, when you move into a routine task, uh, it's, it's, it's that the brain is, is able to recover it.